husbands as to the Lord. For because the head of uh, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. We'll pause right there. Uh, so when you go back to the beginning, right, the book of Genesis, we have a an order in which God brings about the material universe and he establishes the family. Who was made first in the garden? Adam, the human, the man, right? So Adam was made first, and then from Adam was made Eve, the mother of all creation. So the mother, the wife, was in that uh, certain creation order. And Paul will go back to that reference of Adam and Eve, the mother of all creation, to make certain points about the family structure, the way that it is to be structured from God's perspective. And if Paul didn't go back to creation to talk about the family structure that God ordained, then it wouldn't be as forceful or as powerful. So one example of that I'll just mention that I, can't, I cannot get around is when you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and you have the idea of who is to be the one that is speaking primarily or solely when it comes to the Word of God, preaching the Word of God. We have women uh, being silent in the congregation, learning from the men that are speaking. And I've heard, I've tried to let my heart and my mind be open to everyone that disagrees that men are the only authorized gender to be preachers of the Word of God. I've really tried. Now, I've, I've been open to new concepts and new ideas when it comes to things around church, and I've tried to hear both sides of an argument to, to say, well, am I just being biased because I've always heard it traditionally taught this way? Is there something that I'm missing? Is there some kind of loophole that I've, I've not seen? And the only thing about my uh, religious theological understanding of preaching the one thing I can't get around is the command from Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to Timothy that he does not allow women to be preachers. I cannot find a good argument to get around that command, if you will. Right? I've, even, I've tried to listen to a lot of people that disagree with that statement, and I've not heard a good one. Because Paul, after he talks about women being silent in the churches when it comes to preaching the Word of God, then Paul goes for the proof of that argument, of that statement, back to the garden, that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. If he didn't go back to creation, I, it wouldn't be as powerful, but he does. So it's not just a context, cultural, social thing that we find there, where the women in Corinth, for example, were having issues of uh, being silent and usurping authority over the man in that context, he goes back to the garden to, to, as a proof text, not to the culture of the day. Now, so, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, talking about the head coverings that women are to wear, that's obviously cultural because the proof of that is look around your, your area, look around your city, and see what a woman that has their head uncovered shows you. That's cultural. Now, when he goes back to the garden to talk about the role of men and women in the church when it comes to worship and hearing the word of God, that's, that's better. That's a, that's a more forceful position. So again, he goes back to the garden here uh, for the structure of the household. The husband is the head of the wife, just like Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. We've already again covered the idea of how we are to be submissive one to another from verse 21, right? So if everyone is to be submission, uh, submissive to one another, then obviously a wife should be submissive to the husband. Again, it's not a big deal, but again, if you just pull verses 22 and 24 out of its context, away from the previous context, then you obviously have something that you can uh, have a gripe about if you're so inclined. Okay, so then here is this, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Is that a big command? 
<laughs> you keep your mouth shut, Ted. You got me in trouble last week. You said that lady right there was in Dave's class and you were wrong. Keep your comments to yourself. All right, so again, it should not be a big deal. It shouldn't be. Because the idea that everyone should walk in love just as Christ loved us is from the previous context, verse 2 of, of chapter 5. So again, the idea of husbands loving their wives like they're all commanded to love one another, and then the wives to be submissive like they're all commanded to be submissive towards one another shouldn't be a big deal. But those two are emphasized here in the text. Faith. Right. Try to make your wife submit. See how well that goes. I don't know what your family life is like, but you know, when I tell people I'll check my calendar and check with my boss, uh, you know who I'm talking about. Okay? I've got a person who is in charge of my calendar for me. Yeah. That's a really nice way to put it, Anita. Yeah. Kind of strong prior culture. Let's see. Why'd you go to the English? Come on out. Yeah, it, there shouldn't be a, a vie for who's in charge when it comes to this. If you can stay on track, that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. If you, one varies off the track, either one, husband yeah. or wife, then, then you, you have to go back to, to the seat of your relationship, which is Christ. And if you go back to that seat, you just can't go wrong. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> where's Lisa? Yeah, where's Lisa? She's in Dave's class. <laughs> well, she can go on to Dave's class, and that's all right. Good luck, Dave. All right. Uh, let me pause right here. So, yes, I, I agree with all the sentiments thus far. I remember as a new convert, there was this family called, they were, they were the Frenches, that's her last name. And he had Calvin, the husband, and he had Sput, the wife. Her name was Jeanette, we call her Sput, because she was born the same time the Sputnik happened, so Sput, you know. We've got Tater and Sput, how about that? So, you got Sput, and she's a, she has passed away, but Sput was a wonderful Christian lady. And um, I'm satisfied with just a Cottage Below was her favorite song. And you hear her sing off key and off pitch every single time. And she was just singing out loud when she would sing that song. Um, but she was a very uh, strong-willed individual. You, I wouldn't call her hard-headed because that's not very nice. But she was, you know, hard-headed. And so <laughs> Calvin's a very quiet, reserved He's a guy that didn't talk a whole lot, but when he did talk, you listened to what he had to say. He thought a whole lot about what he would say before he said it. And a very gentle but very strong Christian man. And so we were having these things called cottage classes. Do you know what that is? A cottage class? It's a kind of an old school terminology for it. It's kind of like small groups, but not really. It's kind of like you have dinner together and then you kind of have a Bible study about whatever is the topic of the day, right? So we're at his dining room table, we just had, had dinner, and then we had our Bibles out, and I was, I was a new convert, so I was learning all that I could in those cottage classes, and um, so we got to this whole concept about 
wives being submissive to your husbands. So here I am in this Christian family environment, and I know who Sput is. She'll tell you exactly who she is. And then Calvin, you have to kind of crack him open a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on up there. Uh, he's just very quiet. And so I said, well, Calvin, how do, you, how do you navigate this dynamic of wives being submissive and then husbands loving their wives in this, this context? How do you navigate that, like, practically? And he goes, well, you know, I kind of see it like this. You got to pick your battles. And I'd never heard that phrase before, especially with a husband and wife relationship. And by this point, I was already engaged to Melissa. She was 16, I was 17. And so we were you know, adults almost. So, right. right. So I was like, okay, all right, I said, pick your battles, whatever that means. And he was like, yeah, you know, the, the little, the things that are inconsequential, the things that don't really matter. Okay, she can make those decisions. But when it really comes down to brass tacks and something spiritual is being engaged, I'm taking the lead and she's going to submit to, to my decision when it comes to this. And I go, well, how do you know? And she goes, like, well, you'll experience and you'll figure it out. I'm like, okay. So again, that was his explanation to me as a new convert that really kind of struck a chord with me because I realized not every single decision that has to be made needs to be made by the husband alone. That's not the way, this is, this is not the context at all. When it comes to the structure of the family that God ordained, uh, ultimately, the husband is in charge of that dynamic, scripturally. And even more importantly than who makes those decisions, it really comes down to responsibility. And we have elders here in this congregation, right, Tom? I think, so. I think so, yeah. We have guys that call themselves elders. And one of the qualifications for an, a shepherd of the flock of God is that his own family is a good pattern to follow, right? That's one of those um, qualifications, if you will. Uh, he rules his household well, because if he can't rule the house, his household well, then what chance does he have of ruling the flock of God, this big, bigger family unit, well? It's not going to go well, right? So the idea here of this structure being kind of the basis of the family unit is significant. Okay, any more thoughts? I know we have some more ideas going around. We get stuck on it because of our culture, I think. It's a big one. I mean, feminism is a, is a good deal. It's, it's a good deal for some things, no, no doubt about it. But when it comes to trying to look at scripture that's not talking about the culture, but talking about the structure of the family unit, that's where we get kind of, kind of, kind of hung up. Okay. So we'll back up here. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we have a really easy time talking about wives being submissive, but have a really difficult time sometimes talking about husbands loving your wives. What's the Greek word for the word love your wives here in verse 25? Which version of love in the Greek do we have here? It's the big one. Agape. Agape is the, the word here. Now, one working definition for the word agape, when you find it here, it's not loving someone because you're related. It's not loving someone because you feel a kinship with them, like your brethren or your brothers and sisters. Uh, it's not eros, which is never used in scripture, talking about erotic love. This is a kind of love that's self-sacrificial and desiring the best for the other individual, right? So, the good illustration for this that I always go to is my, my children, right? I love my kids. And sometimes loving Maddie is, I mean, it's always easy. Sometimes, sometimes, loving that boy that reminds me of myself a bit too often. He's a little hard-headed, doesn't listen all the time. I don't know where he gets that from, uh, but he needs to be corrected. And I love him, and I always, when I have to discipline him, which has been more recently, 
Now, more than ever, whenever I have to instruct him about something, I always try to conclude the conversation with, I know that you're unhappy, and I know that you are in trouble, and you don't like that, and you've got some things that you want to say to me about that. I value your opinion, but not right now. And I always end it with, my job as your father is to teach you, who will be a young man, how to behave and how to do well in this world. And although you're in trouble, and although you don't like it, this is part of my job, is I love you too much to let you continue down this road of behavior that's going to get you in trouble later. So do you understand, of course? <sighs> yes. I'm like, okay. All right, this may not sink in, but repetition, repetition, repetition. You're going to learn these lessons of how to speak to your mother, how to speak to your sister, how to speak to me. Because if you can learn that here in a safe environment where I love you so much, I'm going to teach you how to treat another individual, another person that will help you the rest of your life, right? You can't speak to people the way that you're speaking to us, for example. And so I love him and that I want the best for him. And that's the kind of love that will, again, discipline. And so it's no surprise to us when we learn about God loving us with agape. He wants the best for us, even enough to correct our behavior through the scriptures. Now, we read that uh, in scripture as well. So, um, okay. Husbands loving your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish that word holy if you haven't gotten the gist yet means a whole lot more than what we have just simply meant as something special right there was a sermon i did not too long ago i know you all remember from isaiah chapter 6 about the idea of a holy god being there and that had a lot of different meaning beyond it than we um, might initially think. So that idea of the church being holy and without blemish is also in here in the text. Um, okay, so what we don't see here in the text is husbands making their wives submissive, as we've noted. What we don't find here in the text is husbands kind of loving their wives, right? Being affectionate towards their wives. This is a self-sacrificial, wanting the best for her kind of love. Uh, any more thoughts about this context? Again, it can be tricky because we bring baggage to the text. Any more thoughts? Okay. In the same way, verse 28, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So the way that we love ourselves should be how we love our spouse, right? That's the ideal pattern here in the text. Now, one thing that can kind of throw a, a, a wrench in this is if you're from verse 29 and you say, well, no one ever hated his own flesh, his own body, and then you, that doesn't resonate with you for whatever reason, that could be a problem. Well, there's that. <laughs> well, that's a whole other conversation. But if you've got an issue, if this, yeah, that's, that's the thing. If you don't like yourself, if you don't love yourself, that's going to come into play when it comes to being told by Paul, just like you love yourself, love your partner. Well, that's a problem if you don't love yourself, right? Some people know exactly what I'm talking about without having to go into too much detail. It's a whole self-value, self-worth kind of situation coming in here. And now we're getting into psychology and marriage and counseling. This is what this is, right? So a lot of this will come into play. If it resonates with you, then you know where I'm going. If it doesn't, then good for you. That's good. You love yourself. That's a good job. Um, because, verse 30, we are members of his body. And then he goes back for a proof text to all this. Therefore, verse 31 a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Where is that quoted from? 
Genesis, the beginning, right? After creation, almost right before the fall, we have this pattern established by God. The mystery is profound. Again, a different mystery, I'd say, from the one previously discussed in, the, in this context in chapter 2. The mystery is profound, but I, what, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his woman as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, um, to kind of state the obvious, why do you think that this command, this whole explanation is here? For unity's sake, yeah. But why is Paul writing about it? What's been our thesis thus far? If Paul needs to address this in his letter to the Ephesian brethren, what does he suspect is going on in Ephesus? They're struggling with this. They're struggling with it. They're having an area, uh, an issue in this area. Otherwise, he wouldn't waste his time while he's in prison writing these brethren about the dynamic of a husband and a wife in this family relationship. So Paul knows them, right? He's spent three years there at least. And Timothy has been reporting back about the issues they're having. He's writing Ephesians and he's saying, listen, you guys should really understand from the creation the pattern that has been established by God of the husband and wife relationship. How you should all treat one another and then specifically in the family unit, how a husband ought to love his wife and how a wife should be submissive to her husband. If that weren't the issue, then why would Paul spend the time writing about it, right? What's that? Could yeah. Also be the example that is very tangible. If you're in a marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. And there, he's trying to make the application just like a marriage. Mm -hmm. You need to be having this type of unity as submitting to each other as a family, as a church. Right. So generally, in verses 1 through 20, when he's talking about everybody should behave in a certain type of way now that you're Christians, right? And he goes, to illustrate that, think about your own family unit. You have a husband, you have a wife, that's Christ and the church as a symbol, as a metaphor, right? So, of course, that's the main application he's saying here. If you understand it in the family, you should understand it in the larger family of Christ. So is it in the family units or the church as a whole? Probably both, yeah. yeah. He wouldn't go into such detail here uh, for the husband and wife relationship if that wasn't a problem, right? So he's just saying... Say again. And it goes back to when he created that woman. Mm -hmm. Because the culture at that time, it was easy to divorce and remarry. It was. So he's going back to the very beginning to say, this is the way marriage should be. And this is the way the church should be. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing that Jesus did, right? It's no surprise to us that Paul is inspired because Christ did the same exact thing. I mean, they came to him and they said, hey, you've heard about the uh, controversy of putting away your wives, divorcing your wives for any reason. Right? What's your take on that? Is it just to divorce your wife for any reason? Um, and then he goes, haven't you heard from the beginning, God made man and woman, and they were to be joined together and be one? That's the ideal example. That's right there. So Christ went back to the beginning of the garden, and so does Paul here in this illustration. Okay. Thoughts? No. Since we're talking about culture and all that. That's always been the thing. It's always been the case. Right? God always says, yeah, your culture says this, but I say this. So there's an idealistic version in all of that. <clears throat> okay. And then, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your, your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and they may live long in the land. So he goes back to a proof text in this, talking about one of those Ten Commandments, right? So honoring your father and mother, obeying your parents and the Lord, this is right. And then the contrast is this, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. What do you think it means, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger? It is very difficult to be a child of someone who is not godly, uh, who 
who does provoke because he might be disciplining him from the wrong standpoint uh, or just might not care. But there you are in a position, if you're the child and you're trying to be a Christian, do you honor this person who is really dishonorable? <laughs> All right. I think when you're also dealing with Luke and you're disciplining him, you don't just discipline him and he'll feel it unjustified. You are teaching him while you discipline him. That's why you say, I am doing this for, and you give the reason. Because right. you're also instructing him in that. And he sees that it's not daddy discipline because he's angry. It's because he wants better for him. Yeah. But you're an honorable person. It's hard when you're. Most of the time. Well, I mean, you know, I, yeah, yeah. Right. but <laughs> it's hard if you're a child, say, be, trying to be a Christian, but you have a parent who is, is provoking you. Yeah. So there's this thing that I do, it's, again, just a bit practical, um, just for my own edification, I suppose, that when I discipline Luke, for example, um, and he needs to be spanked. That's just my position. If you disagree with that, I'm sorry. I'm, that's, that's, that's where I am. He doesn't get there often, but he gets there occasionally where he will need physical discipline to wake him up from, to what he's doing is not correct, not acceptable behavior from him. And conversations happen, talks happen, timeouts happen, and then certain, uh, occasionally he will get to a point, in my opinion, when he needs to be spanked to wake him up to the reality of where he is. And when I choose to spank him when he gets that far along in the process to where that needs to be done from me uh, i always check with myself before i spank him am i doing this out of anger because i'm frustrated and i'm annoyed or is it because he needs to wake up to where he is right now because he's unaware of that again that's every parent's prerogative if you don't spank that's that's not me saying you should i'm just saying in general what I do with myself is I'm checking my own emotions and I'm saying, is this because I'm frustrated or is it because he needs to wake up? And so that's what I do personally as a father to try to live up to what verse 4 has to say, that my intent behind discipline is not because I'm angry and frustrated, it's because I want to instruct him the better way of, of behavior. So that's personally verse 4 in a practical way, how I check in with myself. And so again, I'm not giving you advice about being a parent. I'm just saying for me as a father, I read verse 4 very carefully because I do want to bring them up, our children, in discipline and the instruction of the Lord, but doing it out of anger is not the way to that, in my opinion. Okay. Any questions or thoughts about that? Again, that's a bit more personal. I'm not giving instruction on how to be a parent. I'm not qualified. Your children see, like, how you act, and you're acting angrily, and that, that to me, kind of is where that may be coming from. Because kids get angry about a lot of things, and they could be getting angry about their parents' behavior or whatever. And then, because it says, but, bring them up. So, like, God disciplines us, and He doesn't really care. He makes us mad or not. Okay. <laughs> I know God is an angry me, and I don't think he really cared if it was mad or not, as long as he got his point across. Well, that's true in some way. Take that too far, I, th I think. Uh, you can take it too far in the, in the sense that I mean that uh, the Bible is very clear in the New Testament especially about the discipline of the Lord and instruction of the Lord. It explains it enough times in different contexts that we should be aware of what's going on there. And if he didn't care how we felt about it, he wouldn't spend so much time explaining what he was trying to accomplish. That's all I'm alluding to with my staring off into the corner, trying to find the right words. Yeah. Okay. This one in verse 5, uh, again, remembering that we're talking to a group of citizens of the Roman Empire, and one-third of the population are free men, 
and two-thirds are slaves in some form or another. It says bond servants or slaves, literally. Uh, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service or people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or a free. So the way that they would work in this social economy would be the idea that if you are someone who is a slave or indentured servant to pay off a debt, for example, then you would serve the person that you're working under, if you will, in a sincere way, not just kind of doing what you can to kind of slide under the radar, but working in a sincere way as if you're working for God. Now, the way I've heard it explained and to apply this to a modern context is if you are an employee, the way that you serve your employer would be a similar kind of parallel that you could draw. I don't think that does anything, doesn't take anything away from the actual intent behind the text. I think it's a good thing, but uh, keeping in mind the idea that it's a bit more complicated when you have the idea of it being an employee-employer relationship. It's a different dynamic than they would have had in the Roman world. And so just be aware that it's not a one-for-one illustration. And verse 9, again, if we're going to apply that kind of one-to-one to our modern context, you have the idea if you are a boss if you are a manager of some, of some kind. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. So the way that you treat someone that works for you or under you in this context, keep in mind, if you're a Christian and they're a Christian, you both have the same Lord and same master. That's an important kind of thing to kick in here. I would uh, just note simply that the idea from verse 9, the implication is that they are both Christians. So the way that they treat their Christian slave, their Christian employee, if you will, is quite parallel from verses 5 through 9. Uh, Thoughts about that? Again, giving pretty practical instruction to them where they lived there in that Roman world in Ephesus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, that's true of every relationship, right? I mean, why do my kids do what I tell them to do at this at this stage? I can, I can tell them. Like, yeah, I can beat them up, right? No, just because they don't want to get in trouble. Like, especially with one of them. He just doesn't want to get in trouble, so he does what I, what I say. Not the first time or third time or fifth time. He'll eventually get around to doing what I tell him to do to avoid the punishment. Now, Maddie, that sweet girl, all I have to do is tell her what I want her to accomplish and she does it right away and does it above what I ask. Why? Not to avoid being in trouble because she can't get in trouble in my household. It's, it's the idea that she loves me and I take care of her and I give her chicken nuggets. And because she loves me, she will do what I ask her to do. That's, I mean, I have just the perfect kids to pick on because I have one who's motivated out of love and one who's motivated out of fear. And that's just the perfect illustration because when it comes to obeying God, some people, especially when they're newer in the faith or even not in the faith yet, they're motivated because they don't want to go to hell. And then as that matures and as that development of knowledge grows, they go, I don't want to do what God told me to do just because I'm afraid of the punishment. I want to do it because I love God and he loves me. That fear is not enough to motivate you anymore. It's now based on love, which is the ideal of of maturing there in that development. Um, There's a whole lot more to say about that, but any any more thoughts about that content, that that thought? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it always was. That's the thing. But we as people love those little lists. And just check it off. I've done the thing that God told me to do. I did the thing. Not am I the kind of person who's so motivated by the inside that my actions will reflect what's on the inside. Which is the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, right? You've heard it said, here's the command. But I tell you, it really starts back here on the inside of you. That's that entire context of Jesus saying, listen, I mean, the guys that are religious, the Pharisees, they know the law, but they've got a problem because they're just checking off the box. It's not from the inside first. They cleanse the outside of the cup, but the inside is just um, defiled. Okay, we're going to pick up here in verse 10, Lord willing, next week. Uh, I need to be careful, though, I'm telling myself publicly, I need to be careful because I've got a sermon coming up about the whole armor of God, and I don't want to steal any of the thunder of the text. So we're going to read it briefly and make little comments, and then moving on to the conclusion of this, and then going on to um, Philippians next, which, I mean, my favorite book of all time. Paul writing from prison about how to be full of joy. I mean, of course Paul does that. So we'll pick up here, verse 10. Next week, thank you for your time and your attention, and we'll be dismissed now for about 19 minutes before worship begins.